Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you're welcome to our next session of uh, the ECHO. Every one of us, oh, each, one, each one of us here at least has had time to attend the ECHO sessions that are uh, run by weekly every Friday. So here we have um, another ECHO session um, hosted by uh, Mbale Regional Referral Hospital, organized by Ministry of Health, with support from Seed Global Health. So today we shall be discussing uh, edema in children, and uh, we have uh, a, a number of experts with us. We have case presenters with us, and I'll be your moderator for today. I wish to introduce myself. I'm Init Kawala. I'm a part-time lecturer in the Department of Community and Public Health at Bositema University. And um, I'll be the moderator, just like I said, for today. And I wish to introduce my colleagues. Um, I think we can start from the one next to me. Uh, yes. Over to you. OK, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Okela Didan, resident of pediatrics. OK, thank you, Didan. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Joan Wamuriba Onen. I'm a pediatrician working with Mbali Regional Referral Hospital. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Joan. Good afternoon, everyone. 
Um, my name is Stephen M. Uli, a pediatric uh, resident under Busitama University. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Good afternoon. I'm Lisa Wynn. I'm a pediatrician working with Seed Global Health at Imbale Regional Referral Hospital in Busitama University. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lisa. Our presenters and experts, you're all welcome. Our participants, thank you. We request that uh, uh, some links will be shared in the chat um, for you to register. And in case you have any questions during this session, we shall request you to post some of the questions in the chat. So our next item on the agenda is, uh, okay, um, we have one a colleague who is, part, who is meant to be part of uh, the team. That's Dr. Julian Abeso the head of the Department for Pediatrics and Child Health at Mbale Regional Referral Hospital. Uh, she'll be giving us her uh, contributions, suggestions, and concerns online. Yeah, she didn't manage to be with us today here, yeah, but she's, available, she's with us online. So the next item on the agenda is the pre-test. Pre yeah, so um, the pre-test is posted right there in the chat. We shall give you some five minutes for everyone on uh, online to, to respond to the pretest, and after the five minutes, we shall close the poll. So we request everyone to just give us your responses to those questions. In, I think on your screen, there's something which has appeared, please respond. And in the next few minutes, we shall end the poll. Okay, some people are, um, are not seeing it. Um, the IT team, there are some people come. Where is the pretest? Okay. It's that right there. I think we have one response so far. So let's let's try to to fill out before. We we'll proceed with the session. Meanwhile, I would love to inform you that uh, today's echo session, we are live uh, from uh, Bali Regional Referral Hospital, and we are working with Ministry of Health and uh, the emergency medical services department or in EMS department. So we are live from Bali Regional Referral Hospital and whoever is part of the panel, I think is from within our <laughs> Regional Referral Hospital and our city my university. So. Okay, so the poll is still running. We request you to respond. And as we, we if you're done responding or as we respond to the poll, we, would, we, we wish to listen to some of uh, your expectations from this session. Please share, share with us in the chat. What are your expectations for today's session? Kindly type in the chat. <laughs> Thank 
the pole has disappeared. It has disappeared completely. Okay, let's let's rectify that. Thanks for the question. Yeah, so um, as we wait for the polls to come through, we also request to say, we request you to send us your expectations from this session or for whatever you expect from this session, please just type anything in the chat, we shall read it out. Okay, um, there are some expectations coming through. Um, okay, I can read out some few. Someone wants to know, um, someone is like, WHO rolled out new mom and some guidelines in June 2023. 23, we expect today this presentation to include new updates. Then, um, Isaac Guma uh, expects to learn about um, the classifications and management of dehydration in children. Yeah, with some. Yeah, and the rest of um, the expectations are. are kind of related to the topic of concern, what we are going to discuss today. Most of them are looking at learning at the treat, learning the different treatment options available for edema due to AKI and management of shock in some. Yeah, thank you for all these responses. We shall just keep typing in the chat. We shall respond. I know by the end of, uh, by the, end of the session, some of these expectations will be met. I will be addressed. So I think our time for the poll is done. Yeah, we had five minutes and it's five minutes. It's, 11, it's 15 minutes past two. So I think we can move to the next item on the agenda, which is our case presentation. So I will invite uh, Dr. Emily Steven, a pediatric resident at Worcester University, Faculty of Health Sciences to take us through the case presentation, the first case presentation. Over to you, Dr. Stephen. Thank you. As we, uh, as we wait, we're just uh, arranging for projection so that we can all share. Just a minute. So we are trying to project. Um, Thank you. 
Okay, meanwhile, as we wait for uh, the IT team to share the presentation, um, just to take you through some of the expectations. Um, someone is expecting to learn how to manage mal malnutrition in community settings. I have had more attachments in refugee settings. Then um, WHO updated that ORS can now be used in some, do we have any studies that support this? Then manage of, management of AKI with shock. And then um, uh, a colleague here wants to learn uh, about a management of acute fluid overload in a child. Okay. So most of the uh, expectations are just related to that. Um, finally, there is a colleague here who would, I, I wish to learn more about API investigations and management. So most of the uh, expectations are just around what we are going to discuss today. And I think at the end of the session, we shall have met your expectations. So now that we've successfully uh, shared our first case presentation, uh, I will request Dr. Emily Steven, the case presenter, the, our first case presenter to take us through. Over to you, Stephen. Thank you. Um, so we want to go through this first case as and uh, we're going to present uh, OE a 28-month-old male who was well until five months ago. We developed raw limb swelling with poor appetite and frequent episodes of falling sick. Admitted twice in a Tutur Health Center 4. No history of heart or renal disease and the negative serostatus. He presented one week prior to admission uh, with this of developing loose water stools, non blood stains, and refusal to feed, associated with the bilateral non uh, painful swelling of the lower limbs and skin hypopigmentation, no history of vomiting, abdominal distension or pain, intermittent fever of low grade, not associated with the scissors or loss of consciousness. An occasional productive cough with no difficulty in breathing on uh, history of drenching night sweats. Uh, his assessment revealed a child with 8.1 kilograms, a height of 80 centimeters, which gave a Z score of minus 3 SD. Uh, he was admitted in Budaka Health Center 4 and transfused once before transferring. Tumbale Regional Referral Hospital for further management. ABC airway, uh, breathing was calm. The breathing uh, respiratory uh, rate was 36 cycles per minute with an SPO 298. 
room air, chest. Note on all lung fields with vesicular breath sounds on auscultation. With the circulation on circulation, you had warm extremities, mild pallor, strong pulses with a pulse rate of uh, 102 beats per minute. The capillary field was less than two seconds, with a temperature of 36.5 degrees centigrade. On disability, the GSC, the GCS uh, was intact. The pupils were equal and reactive to light, with a soft neck, normal power on both limbs, and intact sensations. On exposure, we looked at an, uh, an infant, uh, a child with mild facial puffiness, with bilateral uh, pitting, non-tender edema, and skin hypopigmentation visible on all the skin of the body. The chest, uh, posterior anterior wall was normal, no deformities. Abdomen with normal fullness, uh, but loose skin, non-tender on palpation, and there was no organ enlargement on palpation. The signs and symptoms, uh, we saw a, a child sick looking and um, irritable uh, with less interest around uh, on the surrounding, uh, with sparsely distributed and silky hair easily blackable with the facial puffiness, angular stomatitis, bilateral non-tender pitting edema of grade three, general skin hypopigmentation, loose skin on the abdomen, and reduced muscle bulk. Allergies, no known allergies, no uh, medications were reported to have been taken. The past medical history, there was no history of any other known chronic illnesses, negative HIV serum status, no history of surgeries, two hospital admissions with related complaints of fever and loose tools. The last meal that the child had taken was F75 two hours ago. Now the events that surrounded this child's sickness, the mother separated with the father. The father took the child under his care at 18 months. The mother went to pick the child two months having known the child had fallen sick. And one week ago, the child developed a fever and loose stool and refused to feed. The other history about this child was unplanned pregnancy. The sibling, the older sibling, is uh, a difference of about nine months from this child. So the problem list that we had was edematous, severe acute malnutrition, uh, septicemia, and uh, we queried also pulmonary tuberculosis. The follow-up, CBC, uh, the total, white blood cell total of 17.46, HB of 10 grams per deciliter, and the neutrophilia, the other uh, parameters were, were not, uh, Remarkable. HIV was uh, negative. BS for malaria parasites negative. The gastric aspirate taken, gene expert, uh, was negative. Uh, the, the following uh, days, the child weighed 8.0 kilograms and he had been uh, put on IV the prexone, IV gentamicin, and F75. Clinical course. The child's feeding monitored by the amount of feeds he finishes, daily weight uh, monitored, oral antibiotics, and the child transferred to a nutrition unit for catch up phase, stabilization, and stimulation phase before discharge. Mother was given uh, counseling on appropriate preparation of feeds, 
and the balanced diet. So that was our case. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Stephen, for uh, making your presentation within uh, the shortest time. I think we had more three minutes. Thank you so much. Um, we've all heard and uh, listened to Stephen carefully and uh, would wish uh, to invite any person online, any participant to unmute and give us some um, uh, any reaction to regarding the first presentation from the participants online? Anyone with any reaction regarding uh, or related to the first case presentation? Or the experts? Does any of the experts have any reaction to uh, the first case presentation? Anyone from um, among the participants, you can just unmute and and uh, give us your reaction or. Hello. 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 Yes, please. Hello. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stephen, for the case. I think Stephen has we really discussed the case well, and even the diagnosis is fine because the fact that we already had beating edema, uh, starting from the limbs on both sides, and um, the other suspected causes were negative. So this was uh, this is was the right diagnosis. And he has done well to refer to the nutrition unit so that they get specialized management. All right, thank you, Enid, for that response and uh, reaction towards the first uh, presentation. Um, Hello, Enid. Hello, good afternoon. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. Yes, this is Evans, and I I want to appreciate Dr. Stephen for the elaborate presentation of the case. Um, just wanted to inquire. The child was having uh, edema, puffy face. The diagnosis was correct, but I was just wondering: Did we think about doing renal function tests? Uh, could be acute. Uh, kidney injury because that is also part of our topic today and during the presentation he was also querying TB how did he why was he thinking of TB at that particular time was there a, a history of chronic cough because TB also presents with uh, weight loss and all the other B symptoms why, why did he think about TB particularly thank you Okay, thank you, Evans. And that has been uh, noted. We shall respond to that in our subsequent uh, engagements. So um, uh, hello. Okay, let's request him to maybe res respond to that. And uh, because of time, we may not request, we may not receive more questions so that we move to the next item on the agenda. So for now, let's respond to Evans' uh, concern and then we shall proceed to the next item. Thank you, over to Stephen. Thank you, Evan, thank you for asking that question. Um, TB was thought about, uh, thought of, the child had a history of a cough, and uh, regardless of the duration of the cough, it was productive. We had fevers, even though, even though they were not typical of uh, TB features, but in a malnourished child, that we expect a lowered immunity and response to TB is not typical like those who are uh, of good immunity. So anything that indicates we must investigate and be, as, uh, be certain that it's not TB. So that's why we went ahead to suspect and also investigate. Thank you so much. 
Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Stephen. Any of us who wish to supplement on that? Okay. All right. Um, I'll welcome uh, Dr. Joan Wamlugwa to take us through uh, the assessment and inve investigations. But prior to, uh, before she comes, I wish to introduce uh, Dr. Um, Emron Joseph, an EM physician from Katakui General Hospital, who is with us here. He will also be chipping in once in a while to respond to a few questions. Um, yeah, he's online and you'll be chipping in once in a while to respond. So over to you, Dr. Joan, to take us through the assessment and investigations. Okay, uh, Dr. Joseph Emron. Maybe you can take one minute to say a word, introduce yourself. So yeah. you uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator, and thank you very much, everyone who has managed to join us. So I'm Dr. Emily Joseph, an emergency physician. I work in Kadaki General Hospital. I'm here with the team from, from the hospital. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of the discussion. Okay, thank you, Dr. Emron. And uh, we shall welcome you, welcome your supplements. And uh, in case there is anything you'd love to add to whatever we shall be discussing here, please just let us know. So, um, yeah, I welcome Dr. Joan to take us through the next session. Okay, um, thank you very much, the previous presenters. Um, Joan Wamuluba is my name. My role is to take us through the assessment and investigations that we can do in a child with edema. So, um, we need to know what edema is. I know most of us know, but it's just good to remember uh, so that we are in the same page. So edema is a clinical condition which is characterized by an increase in the interstitial fluid volume and with subsequent tissue swelling. So edema is actually, it's, it's a sign of an underlying disease. It's not a diagnosis per se. So when we see edema, we know that we have increased fluid um, and it's because of an underlying disease. So edema can be localized or generalized. By generalized, we mean it's involving uh, the whole body from the face to the toes and all body systems are involved. And this we call an asaka. When it's localized, it's more to a particular system. Uh, for example, in the abdominal system, it will cause ascites, and um, it will also cause pleural effusions in the respiratory system. So um, in brief, what are the mechanisms of edema in children? Like we said, um, it's a symptom that is showing an underlying uh, problem or, underlying, or an underlying disease in a child, depending on the system that is affected. So uh, one of the mechanisms, we have um, increased hydrostatic pressure due to sodium and water retention. Uh, we see this in, uh, in, in congestive heart failure and also in renal failure or in uh, acute glomerulonephritis. We all know about the sodium and water uh, in the mechanism of uh, kidney disease and heart disease. And once we have this retention, we will have uh, increased fluid in the tissues. Uh, also, when we have um, capillary uh, obstruction, heart increased um, hydrostatic capillary 
increased hydrostatic pressure because of, uh, of obstruction, for example, in, in venous obstruction and in liver cirrhosis. Um, also, uh, when we have uh, decreased capillary oncotic pressure, uh, in the case of uh, malnutrition, um, here we usually have uh, reduced protein in the plasma, and because of this, we'll have uh, reduced oncotic pressure, and this will cause subsequent um, fluid, fluid accumulation or edema. Also, in cases of protein losing enteropathy, where we are losing protein in the school, because of hypoalbuminemia, we shall have subsequent fluid overload or subsequent edema. Uh, we have conditions that are going to cause increased permeability of, uh, of, of tissues. Uh, for example, in nephrotic syndrome, we know that we have increased um, permeability of, um, uh, at the base of the capillary, in the of, of, at the capillary level, um, at the basement membrane, in the nephrons, and this will cause uh, increased, uh, we shall lose protein in the urine, and subsequently, uh, we'll also have loss of protein in urine, that is proteinuria, and of course, subsequent high hypo uh, albuminemia, and then subsequent edema. Uh, we may also have lymphatic obstruction that will affect uh, lymphatic drainage of fluid. And because of this obstruction, um, we'll have edema. It can be primarily for edema, where a child has uh, lymphatic obstruction, uh, congenital lymphoedema. We have had children uh, who have uh, edema, especially which is non pitting And uh, we investigate all causes we don't seem to find, and we realize it's actually lymphoedema. We have had cases of iatrogenic fluid overload. Uh, many times when babies are sick, uh, there is a tendency, uh, if not well monitored, there's a tendency of uh, giving lots of fluids without uh, being very cautious of uh, the weight of the child. And uh, these children end up having fluid overload that, of course, eventually can cause heart failure in these children. So in the assessment or evaluation of edema in children, the main goal uh, of evaluating in edema is to determine the underlying cause and the character of the edema. And once we have established the underlying cause, we'll be able to manage the child um, with focus on the system that has been affected. So it's important to identify the conditions that are potentially life threatening. Um, we know that most of the acute cases of edema are self limiting. For example, in acute, um, acute allergic reactions or anaphylaxis, they may be self-limiting. However, it's also important to note uh, the life-threatening ones, like children who come in, in, in heart failure, we may need to act in emergency to be able to save their lives. We have children who come in with um, angioedema. Uh, we know that angioedema is going to affect the respiratory system. We may need to come in to, to, to enable to, to enable um, to avoid um, airway obstruction because it causes uh, it causes uh, um, it causes uh, swelling and can obstruct the airway. So we need to come in very quickly. So edema location is it generalized? Is it localized? Generalized is more of a systemic disease. Uh, for example, um, heart disease or renal disease, um, liver disease. A localized may be more of um, maybe a part of the body system is has been exposed to an allergen, or if we have uh, local inflammation um, in this case of a cellulitis. So this may be able to guide. Um, the, 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 the cause of the edema. And we also need to know the established a time or the onset and duration of symptoms. Is it a sudden onset of the edema? Has it been uh, ongoing for maybe two or three days? Is it progressive? 
uh, is, is the edema on and off? Does it come in particular conditions? Is it there in the morning and wears off by evening? And is the edema pitting or non-pitting? Uh, we also have to look out for any other complaints which are associated uh, to point towards a system which is affected. For example, is there breathlessness in the case of pulmonary edema or in respiratory uh, failure or respiratory distress? Do we have uh, jaundice or yellowing of eyes? Uh, well, we think maybe this is pointing towards a liver disease. Uh, do we have a reduced urine output uh, accompanied with edema? Maybe this could mean um, an acute kidney injury or renal disease. So, uh, also in the history, we have to look at any history of any concurrent prior illnesses. Uh, for example, a history of a sore throat, uh, maybe one to three weeks prior, may signify post-structural problems. Also very important, a uh, family history of recurrent hunger edema may suggest hereditary anger edema. We need to find out if in the family there have been people with similar symptoms of swelling or reacting to allergic triggers. We also have to ask about weight gain and um, history of tight fitting clothes or shoes. Um, sometimes when we see our children growing fat, we may think we are feeding our children very well, but we need to be sure that the increasing in size is appropriate. Is it too fast? Is it in the normal according to the growth chart? Or is it too sudden and going beyond what is expected as for the growth chart? So one of the symptoms that will signify uh, nephrosis is we shall have um, increase in the size. We will notice the child suddenly is not um, the shoes are not fitting, the clothes are becoming smaller, like very fast forward. And so we also need to uh, do a 24-hour dietary recall. Uh, this is in the case of uh, the acute, severe acute malnutrition, the dematous type. Uh, not to forget the history of allergies and uh, current medications. We know that um, some children or some people uh, react to NSAIDs commonly, and we also have uh, another group of drugs, um, anti, 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 anti pressure drugs, SE inhibitors. Uh, these have a tendency of uh, increasing a chemical called bradykinin that will increase uh, permeability of, uh, of tissues and, uh, and, 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 and capillaries, and then we shall have edema. So in the assessment, we have to do anthropometry. Uh, this is the, and, and the general physical exam. I think our first presenter did a good job. Uh, the weight, the height, and uh, Z scores to be able to, to classify. Because we know for children with severe acute malnutrition, there will be Z score, score Z score minus B. And also we have to do a full evaluation of the cardiovascular system. Um, the respiratory system, uh, the abdominal system, you have to rule out um, any localized, much as it may be generalized, or we need to find the exact system which is affected. This is like an overview. If you are to do every detail, we need another, I don't know how much time. So we are pointing out what is important. Uh, increased blood pressure levels. They reflect hypervolemia uh, resulting from um, acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease and glomerulonephritis. So yes, a child with um, edema, we always have to do a blood pressure. And uh, for children, we interpret the measurements uh, depending on their age, the sex, and the height. And if it's increased, then we are most likely having a problem that we need to attend to. Um, also, this is more of a repetition. This near and uh, this. A child with jaundice and a history of failure to thrive, 
respiratory abdominal pain um, may point towards uh, liver disease or protein using enteropathy. Also, um, we also need to look at the colors of the urine. Of course, we know that in acute glomerulonephritis, uh, children will have a Coca Cola urine and they will also present with hypertension. So, also to note that uh, we can have a congenital disorder in children with edema. Uh, for example, in Turner's syndrome, uh, these children will have a uh, webbed neck, they will, be, they will have uh, edematous hands, they will have um, those symptoms. So we always have to think about uh, congenital causes of edema. And in newborns, these will come bleeding, a newborn child bleeding profusely, is edematous all over. We have to think about hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. And of course, go ahead to do the tests that are required. So in the investigations, in the initial tests, um, a full blood count will really guide us, give us uh, an idea of what is happening. And uh, serum chemistry tests, creatinine, blood, urea, nitrogen, and albumin, liver function tests, all these are going to guide us on what specific organ could be affected. Remember, almost all um, organs are affected, but in the initial tests, uh, it will just give us an overview of what could be affected. Urinalysis, depending on how much urine the child is producing, uh, will also guide us. Of course, in the urinalysis, we are looking at uh, protein, the red cell casts, uh, any leukocytes and all those C-reactive protein or ESR, these are acute phase reactants. We know that if they are increased, we are having an inflammatory process going on. So um, also RDT and blood smear for malaria parasites. Being in our setting, we have a lot of malaria that is killing children more than any disease, more than even HIV. And uh, we have had many children get acute uh, kidney injury from malaria. So this is one of the initial tests we have to consider in our searching. And not to forget any known chronic underlying disease of a child. Uh, we have a lot of sickle cell anemia in our setting. And many of these children come in with uh, hemoglobinuria and eventually progress to um, sickle cell property. So when a child is a sickler and they are dematous, let's not only think about uh, severe malaria, severe anemia with um, heart disease or, or with congestive um, heart failure, but they can also be having um, sickle cell associated nephropathy. And as we know, HIV uh, also, if a child has HIV and comes in a dematous, a special consideration. Uh, children with congenital heart diseases or rheumatic heart disease, when they come in with edema, we know that there's uh, something that is triggering them to probably get into heart failure. Uh, also, um, we have children who have blood cancers, uh, especially acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Sometimes they come when they dematas, so we also have to rule out any underlying disease. So in the subsequent testings that we can do, uh, these come after the initial tests have been done because the initial tests will give you an overview of what could be happening to the child. And then um, you go specifically to the organ that has been affected. For example, uh, for kidney disease, when we are thinking of uh, glomerulonephritis, we know that there are many kinds of glomerulonephritis, the commonest being minimal change. Um, we have to go ahead and do the specific tests, including complement testing, uh, serologic tests that may signify renal disease. 
Uh, of course, we have to classify as either hypo complementemic if the glomerulonephritis is no more complementemic or hypo complementemic. We don't do complex in Bali, but um, I believe elsewhere they are being done. So it's important to know what is the ideal to be done when we are suspecting a child to be having glomerulonephritis. Uh, we need to do serologic testings. Um, in this case, like uh, the anti streptococcal antibodies or acetitis. Um, in the case of the post streptococcal glomerulonephritis, um, other tests uh, like the anti-nuclear antibodies, the anti the postulated antibodies, um, if you're suspecting, if you're suspecting like lupus nephritis. Uh, in cases where we don't have a clear apparent cause of the glomerulonephritis, we may consider doing a renal biopsy. For example, we are having heavy proteinuria uh, without a clear underlying cause. We may go ahead and do a renal biopsy to clearly understand uh, the actual diagnosis of the actual cause. Uh, viral infections. Uh, we know that hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV have a role in uh, causing renal disease. Okay, so this is an overview of the investigations, and then also we can go ahead and do uh, imaging. Uh, because we know in congenital causes, uh, like in, cyst in, in cystic kidney disease and hydronephrosis, uh, we can do kidney ultrasonography to determine the presence of two kidneys and also assess the size of the kidneys. And we know that we have cases of posterior urethral valves. So we know that um, these are male babies that may be having poor stream of urine. And here, when you do an ultrasound, we'll find bilateral hydronephrosis. And also, it may either have a thickened bladder or it may not have a thickened bladder. Yeah, these are some of the tests we can do. Uh, for chronic disease or proton losing enteropathy, uh, we may go ahead and do the prostate liver function tests. And uh, we'll see hypoalbuminemia, there will be reduced levels of the albumin. And specifically for protein losing enter enteropathy, we shall not have proteinuria. And uh, also, when we do the liver, the, 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 we have to do a, a total serum protein, of course, which will be reduced. And uh, prothrombin time, which will be raised, meaning that our liver is not functioning, not able to produce the uh, needed. Uh, clotting factors to enable clotting. And the best screening test for protein losing enteropathy, uh, we do the stool alpha 1 antitrypsin test. For heart failure, it's usually clinical. As we know, the child will present with uh, edema, with dyspnea, tachycardia, they'll have a tender hepatomegaly, they'll have a shipnea. And uh, many times we may not have time to run and do the test radiography, the echocardiogram, but it's rather very important. Okay, thank you. So to confirm our diagnosis, of course, after stabilizing the patient, uh, we can go ahead and do those, the test radiography, the echocardiogram, and uh, some lab tests like the brain natriuretic um, peptide. Uh, for venous thrombosis, not very common in children though, but it's good to think about. Uh, here, the children will have localized swelling with discoloration of the extremity of the affected part. So here we can actually do a duplex ultrasonography to confirm this. Uh, for the hemolytic disease of the newborn, we know it is um, uh, the ABO, uh, incompatibility or recess disease. So we go ahead and do the blood typing of the baby and compare it with that of the mother. We confirm this, uh, we go ahead and, and manage emergency. For angioedema, um, here we confirm by doing the complement factors. We do those uh, C1, C4, C2, 
And um, for inherited forms, we know that uh, C4 and C2 levels of the complement factors will be uh, chronically low. Oh. Thank you very much <laughs> for this thing. Okay, thank you, Dr. Joan Wamulugwa from uh, our, our pediatrician at Mbari General Faro Hospital. Um, yeah, our time has been uh, kind of spent, but yeah, this is relevant information that we need to learn from, from our experts. So um, yeah, we've all had, um, she has talked about the assessments and the uh, investigations. However, um, I'm seeing a lot of concerns coming through. Uh, is there anyone having any question um, in regard to what she has shared? Uh, but for the meantime, uh, meanwhile, I would request uh, Dr. Emron to have a supplement. If Dr. Dr. Emron, are you online? And would you wish to supplement? <laughs> Dr. Joseph Emron. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you very much, uh, uh, moderator. Uh, I would like to thank the presenter for breaking down the, the edema. Uh, she's really looked at it broadly, uh, but I, I will do supplement on the approach to a child who is very unwell and having edema. And um, I was impressed with uh, the way the, the case was done. They actually uh, started with uh, the emergency approach. So um, basically, in these children with uh, edema, uh, looking at the emergency part of it, I am really looking out for red flags, things like, is this child having a, a respiratory distress, is signs of major organ failure, and uh, worrying things like um, anaphylaxis. And um, uh, the approach I would use in this case is basically the ABCD. You want to be sure that uh, your airway is clear and patent, your child is breathing well. And if you get anything along the way, you first want to, to correct that. Um, sometimes uh, with uh, edema, let's say a child has very massive edema, Actually, now it's with things like um, you know, respiratory distress, maybe the child has pulmonary edema, or there is massive accumulation of fluids in one of the um, organs, they say abdomen, massive ascites and it's interfering with breathing, or massive uh, pleural effusion and it's interfering with breathing. So, those are the things that you want to address first the life threatening, and then you can systematically go on to do your history and the uh, um, address the under, underlying cause. And clearly, what you could see is that some of the conditions that will require a longer time for you to identify, especially uh, those autoimmune kidney conditions, it will take time for, yes. you to, for you to identify them. Um, so emergency approach, uh, you go systematically, the ABCD, and focus on the the life-threatening things at that point, and uh, then you can systematically go and find out the, the root cause. And um, uh, we're working in collaborations with, uh, uh, I, you might not work in collaborations with other consultants, let's say nephrologists, uh, maybe cardiologists, and uh, yes, that's what I can add on. Okay, thank you, Dr. Emron. Um, there are several questions in the chat, but uh, you will allow us to respond to some of them while uh, you can look at uh, some of the responses will be coming through from the experts via the chat section. However, uh, is there anyone who would wish to mute and ask just one question before we go to the next uh, case presentation or this, this next item on our agenda? Any question from the participants? Feel free to unmute. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if we are all silent, it means that uh, there is no question. However, if you have any question and you cannot speak, just type it in the chat. Uh, Dr. Joan will respond to you right away. So I wish to welcome Dr. Juliana Beso. I don't know whether she's online. 
Dr. Julian Abeso from Bali yes, Regional please. Hospital. Yes, it is in it. I'm online. Eh? Okay, Dr. Julian, thank you. You're welcome to uh, the echo session. Just like I said before, she's uh, one of us, uh, one of the experts on, on uh, part of the team. She's the head of department for pediatrics and child health at Mbari Regional Referral Hospital. And she'll be taking us through the management of severe acute malnutrition or SAM. So over to you, Dr. Beso. You're most welcome. Thank you so much, Enid, and uh, the other presenters, and of course the the audience. Um, this is a, a good moment for Mbale, but also for the whole of pediatrics. It's good that you chose this particular topic. Um, the management of severe acute malnutrition is a very broad. Um, it's a very broad topic. And as such, I haven't even made uh, like slides for it because I think it is better discussed from context to context. For instance, in this patient, there were uh, other issues and then in another uh, context, there may be other issues. However, since we are having this, the echo is an emergency kind of scenario uh, session. I, I, I feel that our case wasn't really our, an emergency now, but, but of course we have to know how to manage severe acute malnutrition in an emergency situation. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Joanne because she has actually helped me to, to, to make it smoother. So um, what really happens in severe acute malnutrition is that the patients get uh, what we call reductive adaptation. And in reductive adaptation, like all the other systems kind of, uh, they slow down. To allow the, the, vital, the, the, the body to find that vital organs like so many vital organs will shut down, the child will become weak they, because they don't really have to keep running. It's not vital for them to keep running around according to the body. So you will find that certain vital organs like the brain and the heart may be the last to get shut down. Not shut down, but slowed down. So because the systems have slowed down, you find that the patient will be at risk of so many things. Hmm? For instance, the heart is slowing down, so you know there will be risks related to heart issues. There will be related issues related to the kidney, issues related to the liver, issues related to the, the brain, and, and all the organs will have some issue to do with slowing down. So when you receive this patient as an emergency, you handle the emergency that presents now. And the, of course, we shall go through the ABCs. So the first thing is that when you receive an emergency, of course, you have to go through the airway, um, the, the breathing, the saturation, disability, and so on. But then uh, as along the way, you can also take, you know, some kind of like, uh, history to, to help guide you to know what the problem is. But you can't take a very uh, like long history to try and rule out the, the causes like the way uh, Dr. Joan has taken us through. But of course you will take the vital history, like how is this child, um, maybe when, what is the problem, you know, that kind of thing, because it will guide you on what to do next. Things like when did this child last feed? And you know, because yes, you're looking out, you, you're watching, you want to see what are the symptoms? Is the child convulsing now? Is he too weak? Is he what? So you, you get that emergency history. And then you also briefly go through the assessment. Eh? And in the assessment, that's when you check the airway, see is the child, <clears throat> is the, the airway patent, 
is there any abnormal breathing coming out of you know um, abnormal sounds is uh you know then you check the breathing is the child breathing is the chest moving is um you check the oxygen saturations you check the capillary refill you check for signs in the sea you check for signs of of what of dehydration and in a malnourished child, it is very hard to find signs of uh, dehydration. But once the child, if you ask the mother and she tells you that the child has diarrhea, then uh, probably that child could be having some element of dehydration. Because you remember that you will have the, the signs of dehydration in a normal child are exactly the signs that will appear in a malnourished child. Like the skin will be sagging, but doesn't necessarily mean that that child is dehydrated because even malnutrition will cause sagging of the, the skin. Uh, so you may have to rely on things like, uh, like tears, things like dry um, mouth, oral uh, mucosa, you know, those are the atypical signs though dehydration those are the ones you're going to look out for then of course you have to look out for signs of shock is this child uh, cold at the extremities cold how is the the respiratory rate is it very high depending on the child's age so you should know the cutoff for children who are maybe less than two months for children who are less than one year, for children above one year, you need to know the cutoffs of the respiratory rate. Then you also look out for the, what the pulse rate. And um, yes, so those are the things, the emergency things that you really look out for. And if the child is convulsing, then you, 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 you follow the guidelines for controlling the convulsions. But overall, when you're managing a child with severe acute malnutrition, you follow what we call the 10 point, uh, the a logarithm, the guideline, see? So you look out, if the child has hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia meaning maybe if they have a history of uh, having not fed for a, maybe longer than three hours or if the child is very weak, which is normally the case when they come anyway, or if you're able to do, you can do a random blood sugar. If the random blood sugar is three millimoles and below, then it means that child has hypoglycemia. If the, the random blood sugar is three millimoles, or if any of those signs, if the child is very weak, has not fed in a long time, then it means that child has hypoglycemia. So you give sugar water, you give sugar water, 50 mils of, of sugar water, or you, if you, you're in a setting where you can give an IV kind of infusion, you can actually give 10% uh, of dextrose, okay? According to the child's weight. Then uh, for children who cannot take orally and they are quite weak and you're in a setting where you cannot do any infusion, you can actually insert an IV, uh, a what, an NG tube, and give it orally. Now, of course, when you you go into hypoglycemia, you also have to look out for things like, uh, like we talked about the dehydration, because a child with uh, who is malnourished and is severely uh, dehydrated, and uh, maybe has shock signs of shock, you have to manage them because that is an emergency. So you have to manage the shock, but you don't follow the guideline like it is for these other normal children. If the child has dehydration, you've proved that they have dehydration, they have a diarrhea, and they are not edematous. They, are, they have severe acute malnutrition, but they are not edematous then that child can be on Rizomo. But the best thing to do in malnutrition is that immediately the child comes after you've done the assessments and so on. Find best ways of how you can start the F75 because the F75 will prevent hypoglycemia or treat it 
plus also treats the what? The malnutrition, okay? Then of course, the other thing is that you, if it is, if, if the child has severe acute malnutrition, is dehydrated, but is not in shock and has edema, edema grade three, I mean grade three and above, then it means that kind of child, you should not give fluids anyhow. You don't give fluids anyhow, but if they have uh, diarrhea, like frequent motions of diarrhea, then when you, you have to look at the guidelines or you consult a senior so that they tell you how to go about uh, rehydration in a child who has severe acute malnutrition with edema. But for the child with edema, with edema and or has no edema and has severe acute malnutrition and is in shock, for that child, you have to manage. And the signs of shock, uh, if the, the pulse is thready, it is thin, thready, it is very fast, the extremities are cold. If you get those signs, then it means that child is in shock. So for that child, you have to manage. And usually we don't use the same amount of fluids, like the fluids that we use in the normal children. We don't use the same, uh, maybe 20 bolus cells of 20 mils per kg. No, 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 no. For this, the child with severe acute malnutrition, we reduce the, the, the type, the fluids. We give them five to seven meals per kg and we give it slowly. And as we are giving, we are monitoring the pulse rate, the respiratory rate, and the general um, status of the child. Because remember that a child with severe acute malnutrition can easily get uh, overperfused. So we do not want to what do to risk being uh, overperfusing them. Now, this takes me to a certain in the important tool or for managing a child with severe acute malnutrition with an emergency because the tool actually guides us on how we 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 can how much fluid we can give and how to monitor the respiratory rate the pulse rate and all those things it is a, a tool that we use like how you can use a tool for critical care in an HDU setting or in a, a what an ICU. The tool that you use and you keep recording, like after every 30 minutes or every 10 minutes, depending on how the condition of the patient is. So it is important for us to have a critical care chart if you're managing a child who is acutely ill and they have severe acute malnutrition. Okay. Now after you have looked out for, you know, you've treated the, you've tried the dehydrate, the hydration, the hypoglycemia, dehydration, shock. There are also things that you have to look out for, like the electrolyte imbalances. Many times these children have electrolyte imbalances. And what will usually show you is that uh, you can find that they have paralytic ileus. The abdomen starts distending. Even you're giving your feeds, your fluids, but the abdomen is what is distending. So in that kind of instance, then you may have to stop giving oral fluids. You rest the gut. Of course, you put an NG tube, rest the gut. And if it is hypokalemia, which is usually the commonest uh, cause, because you know a child who is malnourished, they lose potassium in the, 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 the fluid spaces, but they also uh, lose it in the like vomiting, the diarrhea, all those things, they're actually losing potassium. So you may actually have to replace the particular fluid. So this brings us to the point of doing like electrolytes and all those things. Then uh, there also comes uh, issues like um, uh, if they are anemic, Many of these children don't have only severe acute malnutrition, only not, they don't have only the micronutrient deficiency, but they also have macronutrient deficiencies. So you will find that most children who have severe acute malnutrition, 
may actually present with anemia because uh, they may be having iron deficiency. But what you do in that instance is that if they have uh, anemia and their HB is above four milligrams per deciliter and they are stable, they are not in CCF, there is no need for you to what? To transfuse them. But if they have an HB of four milligrams per deciliter uh, and above, uh, or between four to six, and they are in CCF and they have severe respiratory distress, you may actually have to transfuse because you have to improve on the iron carrying, uh, the, the oxygen carrying ability. So you may find that you will have to what? You will have to, to, to give them some, maybe some, 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 some uh, packed cells. You cannot use, uh, whole blood, because we say they are at risk, their heart has slowed down, their liver has slowed down, so you cannot give what? You cannot give uh, whole blood. So you will have to use packed cells. And you'll use packed cells at still five to seven um, meals per kg. Not like in the normal child where you give 10 meals per kg, you realize that for this one, you're giving at a lower um, amount because you don't want to run into of a perfusion. Dr. Now, Abeso, for children, Dr. Yes, Abeso, um, yes. Uh, I appreciate you for uh, sharing that knowledge with us. Um, uh, time, our time is past spent. I, I wish you uh, to request you to co conclude in the next few minutes so that we go to the next aspect of uh, the agenda. Okay, thank yeah. you so much. So, um, for, 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 like I was saying, for children who have HB of four milligrams per deciliter and below, and they have severe acute malnutrition, those ones you have to transfuse. Now, there are some things that you cannot do. Like if a child who, who, who has uh, severe acute malnutrition is in CCF, you manage the CCF, but don't give the goxin. You can give lesix, but you don't give uh, many doses. You give like a start dose or whatever. But please, when you're managing CCF in severe acute malnutrition, don't give digoxin. Okay. Now, uh, the other thing is that when we're talking about shock, you realize that if a child is in shock, uh, their perfusion is low and all those things. So they should be on oxygen. And the, it can be that they are hypoglycemic, so you, you need to give 10% dextrose. And then, of course, you have to do investigations to find out the other causes of shock. So management of severe acute malnutrition is actually a very wide area, and uh, it's quite interesting. And uh, it will make you run around, because these are the patients that have to be in their own place so that you keep monitoring them every 10 minutes or so. Thank you so much. Wow, that's wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Beso, our head of department at Timbali Regional Referral Hospital. That has been beautiful, enlightening, and I'm seeing several comments coming through. Let's come, um, the chat has more information. Because we have other team members from mm -hmm. Bar Regional Referral Hospital, part of the pediatric youth uh, ward, who are trying to engage with the participants online. So, Dr. Kirol and the team, please, great work done. Let's proceed. Any person with any question, any participant with any concern, any question related to what Dr. Beso has shared with us before we proceed? Anyone online? With any concern or question, we can give you a minute. Okay. Yes, please. Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to say thank you so much, Doctor, for that presentation. However, my inquiry was about uh, a child with uh, a, a macro uh, malnutrition nutrition deficiency, uh, basically about the management uh the, the 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 fluids the replacement of the, the micronutrient basically that's what i wanted to know more 
Okay, thank you so much. Um, over to Dr. Beso to respond to that. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for that question. Uh, like you heard me emphasizing, I kept saying that the child has got to be on F75 because F75 contains most of those micronutrients which are necessary for a child to, to what? To, to improve when they have a complication. Actually, that type of management, the acute management of malnutrition, the emergency management is what we call the stabilization phase. So what we are interested is in helping the child to cope with the reductive adaptation and the complication that they have. The F100 will come later when the child has been stabilized, when we've controlled the what? The emergency. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you, Dr. Beso, for responding to that. Uh, the rest, let's keep our questions coming through. Uh, we have our questions uh, from the pediatric wards. Um, Barry Jennifer and Bositema who are online, they will keep responding to, uh, to all the concerns. Um, let's move to our next uh, case presentation on uh, acute kidney injury. And I would like to welcome Dr. Didan Okelo, a resident at Wisitema University, a Faculty of Health Sciences, to take us through. Over to you, Dr. Didan Okelo. Okay, uh, thank you so much. and. Uh... Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to present uh, this case in view of putting in mind the emergency aspect of it. So when you look at edema or a child with edema, could it be acute kidney injury? I'm Dr. Kelo Dedem from Musitema University, as mentioned before. So uh, YK, a four-year-old patient presented with a two-week history of uh, general body swelling, which started gradually with a febrile illness that lasted uh, one week. That had lasted for one week and was managed using a non-intravenous medication. Uh, the body swelling began with significant facial puffiness that was pro uh, prominent on waking up in the morning hours, but resolved by the day and progressed gradually to significant general body swelling later. There was a significant uh, five-day history of passing t colored urine and reduced volume on voiding compared to before the febrile illness. There is no history of easy fatigability on exertion or shortly after playing, and no paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, but history of orthoponia and uh, difficulty in breathing for four days. There is no uh, lots of appetite, no abdominal pain, no history of passing loose tools, and no vomiting was reported. Uh, the primary survey at emergency department, the airway and uh, cervical spine, the findings, the child was in obvious respiratory distress, uh, but was able to talk and uh, support his neck. Breathing, the respiratory rate was uh, 45 cycles per minute, and the SpO2s were 90% at room, at room air. Chest movement uh, was symmetrical on respiration and there was no tenderness. Had adult percussion knots in the inframammary and subscapular regions bilaterally. There was reduced breath sounds with crackles in the inframammary, axilla, and subscapular region bilaterally. The interventions that were given we initiated the, uh, the child on oxygen therapy but via another prongs to, uh, with an aim of getting an SpO2 of 98%. The saturation, uh, the child was uh, had warm extremities. There was no pallor, but there was a tachycardia 144 uh, beats per minute with a strong pulse. Uh, the BP was uh, 146 uh, out of 98 
millimeters of mercury, and this puts the child at the 99th percentile for age. Uh, the capillary field was less than uh, two seconds. The interventions done here, we continued oxygen administration and 30 minutes monitoring for the BP. Anti-hypertensives, hydrolazine, 0.1 milligrams per kg, six other was initiated. A diuretic, IV furosemide, two milligrams per kilogram was also initiated. And there was uh, fluid management, restriction of fluids, and monitoring. The disability. Yes, the eye opening was. And then we also have the, the best verbal response was five. The motor response was six, giving us a total of 15 out of 15, meaning the child was fully conscious. Uh, the child was oriented in time, person, and, and place. And the pupils, they were equal and reactive to light. The neck was soft. There was no more power in all limbs. The interventions uh, was none, but we had to do periodic monitoring of the child. The exposure, the temperature was 37.8 uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, that meant uh, the child was febrile. And also the child had edema. Which it was by uh, uh, Anasaka. The interventions, we exposed the child and encouraged tepid sponging and monitored every 30 minutes. So using the sample analogy, we looked at the signs and symptoms. There was uh, fast breath, nasal flaring with difficulty in breathing. There were no known allergies or the unknown so far by the time we saw this child. The medications, the child previously had anti malarials and received analgesics, especially they were used ibuprofen before. And the past medical history, the child was treated for severe malaria and Darkerin syndrome at the lower health facility. And the last meal this child had eaten was breakfast four hours ago, which was milk tea with mandazi. Uh, the events around, there was no significant events reported. Our problem is therefore, when we saw this child was hypertensive emergency in, in view of uh, the reduced urine output as well as the high, uh, high blood pressure at the 99th percentile for age, hypoxia, wearing uh, pulmonary edema, and uh, acute kidney injury. But also there could have been a continuation of malaria due to the fever. The follow-up, we requested for renal function tests and serum electrolytes. At the time uh, we wrote this, uh, the results had not yet been provided, though the samples were taken. The chest X-ray showed increased uh, parenchymal opacity with curly lines and the peri uh, bronchial coughing with enlarged uh, pulmonary arteries. We also made sure that we do a daily weight monitoring, uh, um, blood pressure monitoring, fluid and salt restriction, and we encourage the enrollment of this child in the uh, chronic disease clinic. That is my presentation. Well, thank you, Didan, uh, for that wonderful case presentation and for keeping time. Uh, yeah, we've all heard what Didan has presented to us, the entire case, what was done. Um, from the from the participants, is there anyone who would wish to you know ask a question regarding the case presented before we go through the management of acute, acute kidney injury? Any question? Any concern regarding the case presented? Feel free to mute. Yeah, just one participant, but I did, you can also respond. You can send in your questions through the chat. You can also respond through the chat. So if there is no hand up, um, I would like to invite Dr. Lisa. Dr. Lisa is our seed educator at Zimbabwe. Oh, there is Joshua. Joshua, do you have a, course, a question, a concern? Something we'd love to put across in relation to the case presented. Just unmute and say what, say something. Hello, okay, Jessica. it's okay. I would like to 
Yes. Yes, I would like to salute everyone around. Yeah, so about the case presented on acute kidney injury, I, I wanted to ask at the point where, where okay, when you are checking out through the, the checkup list. So you, you talked about the, um, the X-ray and the chest examination. How, what are other conditions, the other, um, the other thing we are mainly looking up to when we are checking on through these examinations? Okay. Did you get that word? Yeah. Hi, Lindy. Uh, specify. Specify. Yes, sir. I was talking about the chest examination, like the chest examination. Mm. Okay. That's clear too. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Yes. Uh, how, how is it direct, direct related to the acute kidney? The acute kidney injury. Yes, that's what it's what I want to know. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, the chest examination were helpful in the pulmonary edema diagnosis because with this child had difficulty in breathing and also had crackles on listening to the chest. There are four, and remember also had an asaka. So the, uh, the X-ray or the chest examinations were helpful in making sure that we diagnose pulmonary edema so as to manage. Yes, sir, I hope that has been answered. Okay. Um, okay, yes, yes, I got I got the word. All right. Okay. So um hello. Hmm? Hello. Yes, please. Uh yes, thank you very much, Judith, for, for that wonderful presentation. But in this case, uh, I really wanted to I wanted to, to to know the details of the uh, renal function test and liver function test, and also the CBC. It wasn't so much clear and the results were not there. We really wanted to know what are the parameters, how does it look like? Thank you. Okay. Yes, uh, as I mentioned, uh, when I was asked to present this case yesterday night, mm -hmm. I hadn't gotten the results and I couldn't cook the results anyway. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, I think that's been clear to us. Yeah, so for now we don't have the results. Okay, um, next we shall go to um, Dr. Lisa, our educator from Seed Global Health, attached to the City of University in Bale General Repair Hospital and in Bale College of Health Sciences to take us through the management of acute kidney injury. Dr. Lisa, you're welcome. Okay, so I'll be talking about the emergency management of acute kidney injury in children. Acute kidney injury, or AKI, is defined as an acute decrease in glomerular filtration rate, which results in an increase in serum creatinine. Several different measures can be used to diagnose an individual with AKI. These include an increase in serum creatinine by more than 0.3 milligrams per deciliter within 48 hours, an increase in serum creatinine by more than 1.5 times baseline, which is typically based on a presumed normal value or known value in the previous seven days, or a urine volume of less than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour for six or more hours. When interpreting serum creatinine levels, it's important to remember that due to lower muscle mass, children have lower baseline creatinine than adults, and therefore increases in, that occur in AKI may be less dramatic or result in values that are near normal in compared to the reference range. While specific laboratory values may not be available in all cases, concern for the presence of AKI should be raised when children present with poor urine output or very dark urine, as these are often the easiest signs to identify and was the case for our patients recently presented. Children at risk for developing AKI include those with a wide variety of presentations, including hypovolemia, sepsis, trauma, hypoxia, nephrotic syndrome, malaria, and sickle cell disease. As with many cases in pediatrics, prevention is key and careful attention to rehydrating patients is essential to preventing progression of illness. All children that present with decreased urine output or conditions that place them at risk for AKI should be assessed for the need for IV fluids or NG tube hydration or oral rehydration treatment. 
As with any emergency, the evaluation of a child with acute in kidney injury should be initially approached utilizing the ABCDE method. These children are at risk of airway compromise due to decreased levels of consciousness resulting from underlying illness that may impair their ability to protect their airway. Breathing can be compromised due to the presence of pulmonary edema, as we saw in the case presented. Assessment of circulation and volume status is particularly important in children with AKI. They can present with either hypovolemia or fluid overload. Temperature and blood glucose can be abnormal as a result of illness and poor PO intake. And exposure to nephrotoxic drugs and specific pathogens such as malaria should be identified. As previously mentioned, careful assessment of fluid status is essential in evaluation of a patient with AKI, as patients may present with either volume overload or volume depletion. Heart rate, capillary refill, and peripheral per perfusion are all important measures in this assessment. Blood pressure is less helpful due to the association of renal disease with hypertension, decreasing the sensitivity of hypotension as a marker of hypovolemia in these patients. And as we saw in the case presented, the patient presented with hypertension, likely as a result of their underlying renal pathology. <clears throat> Acute kidney injury is typically classified based on its etiology as being either pre-renal, intrinsic, or post-renal. In children, the vast majority of cases are either pre-renal or intrinsic. Pre-renal injury is the result of decreased renal perfusion. This is typically the re result of hypovolemia. Common causes include a combination of common pediatric illnesses, such as vomiting, diarrhea, poor oral intake. However, may also include causes related to uh, cardiovascular compromise, such as heart failure um, or sepsis. Infants are at increased risk for excessive volume losses and pre-renal injury because of the kidney's inability to concentrate urine maximally and to conserve salt and water adequately. Pre-renal injury manifests with decreased urine output, normal urinary sediment, increased urine osmolality, and increased BUN to creatinine ratio. Children presenting with pre-renal injury often require fluid resuscitation to replace lost volume. If pre-renal injury is not appropriately and timely addressed, it can progress and lead to additional cellular damage and findings more consistent with intrinsic injury. Fluid resuscitation should be done with frequent reevaluation and with attention to, oh uh, no, um, to giving weight-based boluses. Intrinsic injury is the result of parenchymal injury and due to vascular spasm, intravascular coagulation, and microvascular injury. Um, common causes in pediatrics include glomerulonephritis, hemolytic urine mix syndrome, nephrotoxic drugs, and frequently in Uganda, malaria and sickle cell disease, both, both of which can result in massive hemolysis, which can obstruct tubules and cause direct toxic effects to the kidneys. Um, children presenting with intrinsic renal injury may have excess total body fluid as a result of the kidney's inability to filter through the glomerulus and loop of Henle. Similar to those with pre-renal injury, they will present with decreased urine output. However, because of the cellular injury, they will have urine sediment in the form of red blood cells and cast. Management of acute kidney injury in children. As previously mentioned, the most important step in management is prevention and adequate hydration during times of illness. In the event that the illness progresses, fluid resuscitation may be indicated. Um, priorities include fluid resuscitation, if indicated, correction of electrolyte imbalances. Specifically, patients with AKI are at risk of metabolic acidosis hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, and hypocalcemia. Um, potassium may be further exacerbated by hemolysis associated with underlying illnesses such as malaria or sickle cell vasoocclusive crisis, further exacerbating this problem. Dialysis um, may be needed. Um, early Anticipation of the need for dialysis may be indicated for patients with refractory hyperkalemia, volume overload with failure to respond to management, intractable acidosis, uremic encephalopathy, pericarditis, pleuritis, or removal of certain toxins, 
um, such as ethylene glycol, salicylate overdose, severe valproic acid toxicity, or lithium poisoning. As we think about these patients and the potential need for fluid resuscitation or administration of fluid, um, in patients with AKI, the IV fluid of choice should be normal saline. Lactated ringers should be avoided until you have confirmed the patient's ability to produce urine as it contains formula equivalents of potassium per liter and could exacerbate existing hyperkalemia. Um, it can be considered in the setting of normal potassium as it has been shown to have some benefit in addressing metabolic acidosis that might be present. Crystalloid solutions such as albumin may be useful, um, but have not consistently been shown to decrease future need for renal replacement therapy in patients with AKI, and therefore there's no need to prioritize that if it's not available. D5 is preferred over D10 for treatment of hypoglycemia in patients with severe AKI as it's an isotonic fluid. Um, hyperglycemia has been associated with worse outcomes in these patients. Uh, if blood is needed for the treatment of severe anemia, such as may be the case in children with severe malaria or sickle cell disease, they should be given packed red blood cells and administered over a slower period of time. Um, these patients with intr have intrinsic injury and, and associated edema. Um, they may have impaired ability to compensate for large shifts in their intravascular volume. Uh, the presence of severe hyperkalemia in patients with AKI can be life-threatening um, due to the potential for cardiac arrhythmias. If present, treatment of hyperkalemia can be approached using the C big K mnemonic. C is for calcium gluconate, which can be used to stabilize the cardiac membrane. B is for beta-2 agonist and bicarbonate. I is for insulin. G is for glucose, which is used to counteract hypoglycemia that may result from administration of insulin, and K is for k axolate which is also known as solid sodium polystyrene. Um, of note, only k axolate removes potassium from the body, while beta-2 agonist, bicarbonate, and insulin all result in shifting of potassium into cells, but no change in total body potassium. This makes it important to watch for potential rebound hyperkalemia in these patients. Um, Drugs such as aminoglycosides, most commonly gentamicin in the pediatric population and NSAIDs um, should be avoided as well as potential other nephrotoxic medications such as amphotericin and radiologic contrast medias. The um, question of do you give up your my challenge or not in patients with AKI is actually a little bit controversial. Um, while it may seem logical to give an oliguric or aneuric patient a diuretic to stimulate urine production, there continues to be debate regarding the use of furosemide challenges in these patients. Results of investigatory studies suggest that administration of furosemide or mannitol alone does not change the need for renal replacement therapies such as dialysis. Um, despite this, there's good physiologic reasoning behind their use and potential benefits of a challenge. Furosemide prov promotes excretion of sodium and potassium by inhibiting the sodium potassium chloride co co-transporter, um, therefore allowing more water to remain in the tubules. Similarly, mannitol acts as an osmotic diuretic. Both of these may result in an increased urinary flow rate decrease in tubular obstruction, and limit oxygen consumption in already damaged cells. Um, if minimal or no urine output is produced after and only after intravascular fluid status is restored, use of diuretics should be considered based on this physiology. Um, the efficacy of diuretics depends on the renal tubular concentration of diuretic, uh, which depends on drug filtration and, and may be impaired in patients with AKI. Um, and because of this, the furosemide might have to be administered in higher than typical doses in these patients. Um, it's typically recommended that a challenge dose of furosemide ranges from two to five milligrams per kilogram in a single large dose instead of multiple smaller doses. Response may be delayed and take more than an hour in these patients because of their delayed processing of furosemide and ability to metabolize it. 
If the patient has a reasonable response and urine output after giving furosemide, continuation of medication may be part of the management plan. However, if no urine results from the challenge dose, then future doses should be withheld. Continuing care of patients with AKI includes treatment of the underlying illness, maintaining a fluid balance, close monitoring of urine output with a goal urine output of at least one milliliter per kilogram per hour, monitoring blood pressure, adequate nutrition, and arranging or ensuring for adequate follow-up care as these patients are at risk for chronic kidney disease. There are some references and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lisa. I think she has tried to elaborate. Yeah, though some, some concerns, I think we are responding to some of the concerns in the chat. Yeah. So a, a new question from the participants. Dr. Umo, um, uh, Nathan Ochom, your hands have been up for some time. Before we go to Dr. Busiku, Francis, I think from Bududa. Let's, let's first listen to Dr. Nathan Ochom or Dr. Omo. No, my, my hand should have been lowered, then the slides were not moving. Eh? That was the concern at that time. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, Dr. Emron, are you are you still there? You could help us uh, supplement. Say something uh, regarding uh, Dr. Um, Lisa's presentation, just to supplement. Meanwhile, yeah. as we wait. Uh, thank you. Thank okay. you very much, moderator. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lisa. Uh, she has actually um, done a very good job. Um, she has looked at uh, this aspect of managing a child with uh, uh, AKI. Um, what I would do, say from... Uh, uh, a practical point of view, you work working in a setting which is a uh, which is low resource. Um, we we do get get challenges like um, first of all um, monitoring the blood pressures, and then uh, sometimes investigations um, and. We can see example from this case, uh, getting the results sometimes can take longer. And if you're in a setting like the one I do work currently, the investigations uh, take a long time. Um, the real challenge, depending on the course, is, is fluid management. And you, you're trying to see whether I should give more fluid or I should restrict more fluid depending on, on the causes. For instance, if in, in nephritic syndrome, we are supposed to, to restrict fluid. However, in certain cases like severe malaria where you have hemolysis, and then in, in certain cases when you have a sickle cell, you may want to add a little more fluid and you're thinking that the, the more fluid is going to clear uh, the, the hemoglobin. So uh, you go to approach it uh, case by case, and um, it, it's more uh, supportive management and trying to address the underlying cause. <laughs> I, I know what other um, moderators, uh, other experts will say, but I, I have seen in some settings, uh, some people are trying to, to do peritoneal dialysis. In those cases where you really see um, what is really needed that might save life is dialysis. But in that case, you may not be able to uh, have access to dialysis. And the, some people go on to uh, use like, uh, they, they get fluid and then um, try to connect it to the peritoneum and do some sort of dialysis. However, in our setting still, that can be challenging. I would like to hear from other experts what their comment is on that. But generally, uh, Dr. Lisa has, has given us uh, what is uh, 
what is the ideal for uh, managing these, these patients. I don't have much to add, but the practicalities uh, of some of these can be really challenging in particular settings. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Emron. I think we can give Dr. Abdesso a chance to say something. Dr. Abdesso, you're welcome. Please unmute. We are not getting. Dr. Abdesso, please unmute. Yeah. Okay. Meanwhile, as we wait for Dr. Beso, uh, David Omo, I think this is Dr. David Omo. The one I know. Yeah. So over to Dr. David Omo. Your hand has been up as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I had a concern on uh, identifying this these clients, the, the children who need dialysis. So when when how do I identify these children who need dialysis, and uh, how do we go about about it? Because our identification of this kid, these children who need dialysis, and the appropriate measures being taken will help them be managed well compared to when we. If we take time, a lot of time not handling them. Thank you. Okay, um, we shall respond to that. Dr. Beso? <laughs> we, we are not hearing. <laughs> okay, you, you can try to type in the chat. <laughs> You're muted. Maybe uh, the IT person can try. Okay. Hey, hello. Good evening. Okay. I think I'm now unmuted. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lisa, for the presentation, the very elaborate presentation. Um, on the chat, someone asked about. Uh, how to increase the index of suspicion of AKI in our setting. And uh, I would like the listeners to know that in our setting, most times the investigations are a problem, but the investigations are in your history and in your clinical examination. So um, for instance, my wonder question that most of us forget to ask is has the child passed urine? When did they last pass urine? And how much urine did they pass? For every critically ill child, we must ask that question because it will drive us to the index of suspicion. Then the other thing is that just by doing a simple urinalysis, you can actually tell that this kidney is having what? Challenges. So even if you're not able to do a, a creatinine and the rest and the rest, you can actually just do, do your clinical examination, your history and do that urinalysis. Um, the Ministry of Health together, of course the malaria control program, uh, myself and a, a number of clinicians are trying to work on an IEC material. And in that IEC material, it will give us a high index of suspicion. It will have something like if you see a child with dark urine, um, do A, B, and C. Do not give uh, diclofenac. Do not uh, give a lot of fluids. Um, for all children who have malaria, give them plenty of oral fluids. Don't give them diclofenac because we realize that most of the causes of uh, AKI in our setting are actually due to lack of taking oral fluids and uh, NSAIDs. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Abeso, for elaborating on that. Dr. Joan, can you say something? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lisa, Dr. Abeso, and uh, Emuron, Dr. Emuron. I would like to also comment uh, about the 
rehydrating children because sometimes we get a scenario where a child is um, is 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 in heart failure at the same time the child is also like dehydrated and you're wondering so what do i give so for children we usually rehydrate based on the need so we have to be very clear to uh, to categorize the level of dehydration before we actually go ahead to rehydrate the child of course if we need to give a uh, fluid, for example, if a child is having um, severe anemia with uh, congestive heart failure, we know that we need to replace uh, with blood. But in such a case where this child is in, having signs of heart failure, we may need to support the heart by giving some lasics. And then we have a scenario where we are thinking this child is having, uh, is having renal failure because they have not passed urine. Uh, sometimes we ignore the fact that Mothers don't pay attention to feeding these children. And she will tell you, go ask, has the baby passed urine? They'll tell you the baby has not passed urine. And if we don't ask when the child last fed, many times these babies can spend a whole 12 hours without actually taking anything. So we need to be able to balance how much of the intake are they taking in, how much of the water, how much of the, uh, we discourage juice, in uh, injuries because we know the patient situation. So many times we actually encourage that we give the oral feeds as a prescription. After this, how much time we are giving maybe 100 or 120 mils per kilo per day. We say every two hours, we are going to give this amount of fluid. And if we follow through and uh, we see that the amount of fluid they have been giving as expected, and we see there's no urine produced, then that would be a high index of suspicion. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Joan, for uh, that clarity. Uh, Dr. Lisa, um, how practical can you diagnose AKI using protein levels in our settings? Since most people don't know their baseline protein levels, how practical is it? So I don't think that creatinine is essential to the diagnosis. Um, decreased urine output, um, over a period of time is significant, would be enough to diagnose it, um, or dark urine and decreased urine output would qualify as a diagnosis of AKI. So creatinine can be helpful, but it's not necessary for the diagnosis. Okay. Wow. Okay. Thank you for elaborating so and about the fluid challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we are in a people are in a rush, health workers in a rush mm -hmm. to give a, um, a fluid challenge. Please be sure of what the child has taken before you give that frozen mic. Mm -hmm. Because in a fluid challenge, you're actually forcing the kidney to produce yeah. urine. But if there is no fluid in the body, so you're going to dehydrate the fluid, mm -hmm. the, the kidneys, and you're yeah. going to worsen the condition. Mm -hmm. So before you do a fluid challenge, let's be sure mm -hmm. of how much has this child taken and assess of how much of the urine, mm -hmm. whether it's um, normal, as in 0 0.5 to 1 mils per kilo per hour. So yes, mm -hmm. I don't know if you have and something. Things like that. capillary refill and peripheral perfusion and pulses can all be really helpful in identifying whether or not you have adequate uh, vascular, intravascular like status right. to give a fluid ch challenge. Okay. okay. I think that has been uh, clarified. Um, uh, it is one of the questions we had in the chat. Um, because we've run out of time, I think we can just respond to one more question. Um, anyone online and uh, has a question to respond to? Um, just one person whose, name, whose hand has been up for some time. Nathan and Ivan. Nathan or Ivan, the first to go. Ivan. Yes, good evening. Good evening. Uh, my question is concerning setting up peritoneal dialysis. Uh, which, which fluid is ideal? How can we go about setting up peritoneal dialysis, especially in case where you're having severe azotemia, urea and creatinine very high? And how can we go about that? Thank you. Okay. That is okay, not thank something you, I do. 
Yeah, Dr. Hisa or the experts can respond, but for as we, as they respond, there is a poll, uh, there is a, a post test. Please respond um, over to you. So that is not an intervention that we offer at Mbale. Um, so I actually can't give you any more information about that. I would assume it would have to be a referral to a higher level of care. Dr. Joanne, do you know? Yeah, so usually when we see that our children are really having um, renal failure that is not um, that is not uh, we're not able to to get the urine out following our uh, renal uh, fluid challenge, and of course the supportive management, antihypertensives, and blah blah, we usually refer them to Lago to do more assessment and and, and continue. Okay, um, Dr. Beso, I, uh, are you still online? Yes, thank you so much. I wanted to, to, to clarify on the need for peritoneal dialysis. Uh, we've been having a lot of uh, AKI in our, especially in this region, the Eastern region, and it's usually linked to malaria. And I can tell you that we've referred less than five children to Mulago for dialysis. What we've seen is that when you treat the malaria and you, you know, you give the fluids according to how they have been given and manage the electrolytes, you will find that these children actually improve within two to three weeks. So the need for peritoneal dialysis should not uh, give you a lot of headache because there are very few children who will actually need the dialysis, especially if the AKI is due to malaria. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Beso. Um, I think for now we can put the session to a close, but before we close, we request you, um, all the participants to uh, to respond to the poll question, there are some, there's a post test. There is a post test, let's all respond um, for the next five minutes. Please don't drop off. <laughs> let's first respond to the... Um, Yeah, there is a link that has been shared in the chat for the CPD points. Please endeavor. Most of you have been requesting for, for it. Yeah, there it is. Please click on it and you'll fill out whatever is necessary. Uh, maybe as we wait for the poll question to, you know, uh, for people to finish up with the poll, um, any parting shots from the experts? Do you have anything to say? Uh, okay, Dr. Beso, you should go first. Dr. Beso, <laughs> that you should go really? first. Okay, uh, first of all, I would like to thank um, Seed Global for putting this uh, together. I would also like to thank uh, Busitema University, Mbale Hospital, and all the people, the presenters, and, and all the listeners. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting that we shall have another presentation probably before the end of the next three months. Um, uh, finally, in regards to my presentation, uh, you realize that I didn't mention antibiotics anywhere, but all children with severe acute malnutrition have got to be on antibiotics because we say their immunity is somehow low. And in the emergency phase, of course, they will be on IV antibiotics as per the Uganda clinical guidelines. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Beso. Uh, Dr. <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Beso. Uh, thank you very much, um, Seed Global, Ositema University, Minister of Health, Mali Regional Referral Hospital, and everyone that has been part of this the participants, the IT team, it's been a great session. Uh, the take home that I would like us to all go with is remember that edema is simply a symptom. It indicates that there's a big problem that is underlying within. So we have to go deeper and uh, investigate and treat the actual cause of the edema. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Joan. 
Um, finally, uh, Dr. Lisa. Um, I will just repeat the thanks and second what Dr. Joanne said, and that most of the information that you need to identify these patients and make your diagnosis is really in the history and physical exam. Um, so we talked about some studies, but identifying the patients at risk and their problems and their your history and physical and intervening early um, will prevent the need for more emergency management and additional investigations. Okay. All right. I uh, wish to thank all our presenters for uh, sparing time to be part of uh, this emergency effort session. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so thank you for being part of this uh, session, the first to be held in Ibadan. Just like uh, my colleagues have said, we look forward to um, Minister of Health coming back here. Ubale, yes, that we share other pertinent topics of concern, especially those that are really of concern in our uh, uh, our regional setting as uh, Bukendi region. So many things have to be talked about. We, I would like to all welcome Dr. Joseph Emron to say a word, and then I'll request after him, we, I'll request all of us to turn our videos on just for a photo, a group photo. <laughs> Yeah, and then we shall call it a day. So uh, Dr. Emron, over to you. Just give us your parting shots and then we shall have a group photo. Yeah, um, thank you very much, uh, moderator. And uh, thank you to SID Global, uh, Minister of Health. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, experts, for uh, being part of this uh, uh, echo session. I, um, I would like to say that uh, uh, learning never stops. Uh, there is uh, a lot that I have personally learned from this session. So I would like to encourage everyone to continue uh, joining the echo session. Uh, the take home uh, points, um, I think we have seen that, uh, you know, uh, clinical, um, uh, clinical assessment, uh, is really, really important uh, in these cases of edema. And you have to start from the emergency uh, part of it and uh, take good history. And uh, in our setting, uh, we all know that uh, getting investigations is hard. Okay, I think his network is unstable. But at least we've picked uh, what is paramount. Right. And, yeah. So we need to take uh, advance. Um, see you next time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Joseph. And thank you for being part of uh, the, this echo session. Uh, we shall request everyone online to uh, put their videos on so that we can take a screenshot of our videos or the participants. Put your video on. And then we shall take a group photo. Kindly put your video on. Wow. Wow. Beautiful. So allow us to just take a group photo. Someone is saying camera is not working. <laughs> Wow. wow, thank you for attending, and uh, we shall invite you for the next session soon. Are we done? Let's keep our videos on. <laughs> Let's show our faces. Eh? Let's try to show our faces. Faces are right there. Wow.
yeah, anyone with a comment, whether from Bali Regional Referral or anywhere, we welcome any comment. <laughs> Dr. Busiku, your hand has been up. What <laughs> give us what's your comment? <laughs> Dr. Busiku Francis. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, this has been a very important thought from it. We are very grateful for uh, for uh, for this. We pray that let it, let it again come back, so that we uh, we learn more on the really uh, issues affecting us the Eastern Region. And uh, we want to thank Dr. Beso, Dr. Joan, and uh, Lisa for that elaborative what, explanation, and even us from the peripheral facilities, uh, we have gained a lot. More especially on this uh, issue of acute kidney injury caused by this uh, darker urine what, uh, syndrome, which is major due to severe anemia. It is it's oh common, it's becoming common, really. Yeah. And uh, we are grateful for this. Thank you very much. We'll see you on uh, the echo session. I hope you're still really making with the hospital. <laughs> Shine. Thank you so much. Um, Thomas, so your hand is up. Did you have any comment? Thomas, open. Open. Okay, if there is no other hand, uh, we appreciate you for being part of Thank you so much, and we wish you a great weekend.